This video is sponsored by Keeps. More on them later. I think we sometimes forget just how scary glitches are sometimes. It's all fun and games when a line of code isn't quite operating properly and we stand to benefit somehow, but by their very nature, glitches are horrendously unpredictable. Just how a game goes wrong varies a lot on the size of the mistake, but for every small texture glitch that you'd barely notice, there's cataclysmic failures that crash the game, permanently corrupt save files, or perhaps something even more terrifying. Video games are, after all, computer programs, and when one of those encounters a large enough error, you tend to see a lot of screens like this as it desperately tries to diagnose what's wrong. Games don't often crash this hard, but sometimes it can get pretty catastrophic and damaging for the long-term health of a console. Bricking a console is a fairly self-explanatory turn that leaves a piece of hardware only useful for throwing through windows, and today I'm going to look at the games that were capable of doing that. Yeah, glitches ain't so fun anymore, are they? Glitches have always been a bit of a sliding scale of catastrophe, where they've always been somewhere between being, like, you know, barely an inconvenience and the actual apocalypse. And now that I think about it, that does remind me about how many men will experience hair loss. Because every two out of three guys will experience some form of male baldness before they turn 35. And luckily, this video is sponsored by Keeps, who are really smart with this sort of stuff. They got their FDA approved trim for hair loss, and they know their stuff. After all, what is hair loss if not like a really inconvenient glitch of life? Glitches are annoyingly inconsistent, so it's good to know that Keeps can be incredibly reliable with their FDA proof treatment for hair loss. These guys are experts at returning hair to thinning scalps with a ton of successful cases under their belts, and they're knowledgeable enough to know that hair loss is different from one guy to the next, which is why their treatment comes in three different variants depending on what kind of hair loss you're experiencing. Plus, you can get everything shipped directly to your door so you don't have to wait for the world to not be on fire before you can fix your hair. Keeps' treatment packages are already cheaper than their competitors, but with the deal they're running with me, you can save even more money. For a limited time offer, you can go to keeps.com forward slash rabbit or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. Stop hair loss now before it's too late. Alrighty then, let's get really It's easy to assume that a game doing permanent damage to a console is enough to affect its perception in the wider world. Yeah, come to think of it, I'd be annoyed if a game did permanent damage to one of my consoles, since not only would I be out of pocket for a replacement, but I'm gonna need a new game to play because fuck if I end up playing this again. That being said, the two generally go hand in hand. If a game is glitchy to the point of putting a console in the ground, there's probably not much game worth playing, even when everything's working properly. That's definitely the case with Mighty No. 9, which I feel has been around forever despite only being 5 years old, but in that time, it has forcibly seared its mark on the games industry through being a woefully underdeveloped puddle of cow sick. I don't know what this poor cow has been eating, but oh man, it does not look good. Looks a bit like pizza, actually. Mighty No. 9's release is one of the strongest weapons it has in its shitty armory. I can't tell you how many hours I put into my 3DS copy of the game because it doesn't exist, despite a 3DS port being part of the pitch on Kickstarter and despite it still having a listing on Amazon. Launch day was a hard day for Mighty No. 9 that it never really recovered from, as many Kickstarter supporters weren't sent the game they were promised, and those who were unfortunate enough to play the game were met by 45 second loading times that preceded one of the worst games of the year. And then, to compound things even further, there were reports of various glitches being stacked on top of each other, and eventually bricking Wii U's that were being asked to play Mighty No. 9. The year was 2016, and so playing this game on the Wii U is one of the saddest scenarios I could imagine, so maybe having both taken away by a potentially potent glitch is actually a blessing in disguise? Hey, it's fine. The Switch was just around the corner, and Mega Man 11 is only two years away, which you can play on the Switch and forget that Keiji Inafune's armpit of a video game ever happened and broke your stuff. That man keeps costing me money! I actually played Mighty No. 9 for the first time shortly after release, so I wasn't as deep in the mire as everyone else, but I remember all those headlines about the Wii U and how everything surrounding Mighty No. 9 was negative, so the fact that the Wii U version could potentially brick your console, you know, it wasn't all that surprising. 
Was there any positives to take out of this whole experience? You know, it, it woke Capcom up. So maybe it's worth all the hardships in the end. Who here remembers Anthem? Anyone? A Anthem? It was a fairly major release not that long ago that I remember mostly for being a duller, grindier version of Destiny with even less content and for having this absolutely bonkers pre-order scheme that I still don't fully understand. It's kind of crazy how bland this game was and just how quickly EA moved Bioware onto other projects with Anthem releasing in 2019 and support being pulled just two years later. And it's definitely boring and mostly featureless, but it's not horrible. Certainly with some of the other games in this video, it's nowhere near as glitchy, and yet, I wouldn't be talking about it at all if there wasn't something hidden away in the code that is capable of launching a torpedo into the side of your several hundred pound game console. Anthem didn't need some glitches to help with all the negative publicity surrounding its release, and yet, you're gonna mention it if it happens to you. I'm not after clout, I just don't want my PS4 to catch fire. In theory, any game could house some kind of console breaking bug, and it's not necessarily reserved for the type of incredibly glitchy all the way through front to back type of games that we're seeing all too often these days. You know, Anthem wasn't even the worst game that released in 2019, I think, but it doesn't really matter. If you had high hopes for this game and it potentially bricked your console, it's the worst thing ever. The wheels came off this thing pretty quickly, didn't it? It was supposed to be Bioware's next massive project after they wrapped up Mass Effect, and for it to deliberately veer away from the character-focused adventures of that franchise and Dragon Age. Still though, it's nothing to worry about, because Bioware are an experienced team with plenty of sway in the industry, and with backing as rich, let's, let's just say rich, as rich as EA, they should be able to make it work. They sure as hell didn't, and it still surprises me how spectacularly wrong it went and the fact that all of this model development somehow spawned a PS4 slaying glitch. It was hardly widespread and maybe only limited to a handful of cases, but any cases where you are diving into the latest AAA big budget action game that has been hyped to hell and back over the last 12 months and you were met with a game crash so heavy that your PS4 can't cope? Yeah, that's not okay. This shouldn't be happening with a game that mostly has its shit together, and whatever blind spot left this in was promptly patched after launch, but reception surrounding Anthem was already shaky at this stage. News that playing the game could leave you without a PS4 did not help in the slightest. It's hard to start a new franchise if no one's got any consoles left to play the sequels. It's like blinding moviegoers after the film has ended. If the past couple of weeks has taught me anything, it'll be that Nintendo doesn't really understand emulation and will likely never understand emulation. Yes, they swing the lawsuits and take down notices around when fans make too much noise with their emulations of classic Nintendo properties, but their own efforts are honestly laughably bad by comparison. The N64 games on Twitch Online are so far short of where they should be that it brings back all too familiar feelings of when Nintendo didn't really know what they were doing with the 3DS. For the most part, I remember the Ambassador program and how it exposed me to Fire Emblem for the first time, but I also remember all the headlines surrounding the original Metroid and how one of the passwords that you can enter can cause your console some serious problems. Some a lot worse than others depending on what system you're playing this game on. Here's a question though, is it a good idea keeping a password that fucks around with the game from a conservationist standpoint? Or should Nintendo do something about a feature that does some damage to the 3DS? Well, we know they're not conservationists, so that just leaves the one option. Metroid 1's password system is a lot of fun to mess around with and something that I wish sequels kept in some capacity. You got four lots of six characters to enter whatever cheat code you fancy that will unlock a load of abilities early or increase Samus' health by a lot, or even just let you play as Samus without her power suit. Just in case you didn't believe the ending that outed her as a woman. Anyway, none of this is as important as Engage Ridley, motherfucker! Which, I gotta say, is a pretty goddamn perfect use of 24 characters if you ask me. It's a simple enough concept, whereas other passwords like to spawn you in new locations with your new gear, Engage Ridley has an invalid starting position within the game's geometry, and so entering the password will likely cause the game to crash and reset back to the title screen. 
That's actually the best case scenario, since emulated versions of this game have gradually become more detached from what the base code of the original Metroid was intending when this code was added to the game, and so if you were to engage Ridley like a motherfucker on the 3DS version, not only is there a virtually guaranteed chance that the game will crash to the main menu, not only will it likely require you to perform an emergency reset on your 3DS, but there's a damn good chance that you'll need a new one, since engage Ridley motherfucker does a pretty good job of bricking 3DSs. I have no idea how it does it, but if the code fucks around with values on an NES ROM then I can imagine the emulator that the 3DS uses has a really hard time reading those values and panics so much that it DIES like a scared goat, but you know, for real. Or maybe the 3DS just really doesn't like swearing. We're all good boys and girls here at Nintendo. This is the sort of topic where the glitchiest games thrive, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. You know, I suppose it's nice that we can find a use for a game that is so glitchy that it kind of transcends any intended experience, but I drew, I do definitely draw a line when, you know, I end up losing a console and have to reach into my pocket for the one thing that can help me out in this situation. Money. And a gun! I would like everyone to note that we got as far as number two in this video about mentioning Bethesda in any capacity, and I was gonna say how great that was until I remembered how my videos are formatted and how popping up later into the video is a progressively more terrible thing, but there is simply no glitches that trash consoles party without the guest of honour. Bethesda have an incredibly unique ethos when it comes to creating new games, and it resembles something like a room full of monkeys clacking away on typewriters. Once they're done creating the game's script, some assets are haphazardly slapped on top, and Todd Howard does his salesman pitch about how much bigger and more detailed this latest game is, as his staff are furiously trying to piece together their shattered game as best as they can. For a while, these flaws were apparent but not really obtrusive enough to cause problems, since games like Skyrim rose above them, but even a broken clock is right twice a day. And every other second of the day, we have to make do with Fallout 76. That's a lot of Fallout, maybe you should have released one of those instead! We're doing a fantastic job of retreading some of the most controversially glitchy games of the last five years, which is a pretty good showcase of the type of games we're looking for. Because when a big AAA game goes badly wrong, it tends to go so wrong that glitches are rampant and intended gameplay is in short supply, and lawsuits are involved, and yeah, sometimes consoles die too. Fallout 76 is unique in this regard because whereas everything we've talked about so far has had some devastating consequences for one specific console due to some perfect alignment of bad luck, Fallout 76 was so glitchy from back to front that it was capable of taking out Xbox Ones, PS4s and even some PCs. That's the wild one for me because I like to think that a new release has a small chance of causing issues with a home console through some botched optimization. but what the hell was happening with Fallout 76 that meant that it was glitchy enough to put down someone's computer? This game is the straw that broke the camel's back as far as so many fans of Bethesda games were concerned, and the frequency with which this game was making negative headlines is something I've very rarely seen before. A story about how it trashed someone's computer is just icing. Wow, this is so realistic. I almost feel like the world has ended. I know this video has been pretty bleak so far, but it's worth remembering just how much fun glitches can be when they're not destroying your property. They allow you to see things 100% unintended by the developer, and I suppose any member on the creative team. And so it's kind of like spinning a roulette wheel to see what you land on. Maybe it's something useful that can give you a massive advantage, or maybe it's something so destructive that whoops, now you don't have much of a console left anymore. Regardless, they're usually a surprise, so you need to know how telegraphed cartridge tilting is and how you should come to expect that fucking around with how the cartridge slots into the N64 will probably cause you a few issues. It's actually the entire basis of the glitch, or rather collection of glitches, because you're interrupting the flow of data into the console and so the game kind of freaks the fuck out and has GoldenEye characters dancing all over the screen and turns Pikachu into some kind of indescribable Lovecraftian horror. What do you mean this might ruin your console? You're talking crazy, man! It only makes sense since cartridge tilting, while the most fun you can have with some of the console destroying glitches we have in this video, does have a nasty habit of destroying those cartridges. 
I won't pretend that I know exactly how they work and what is slowly being worn away by tilting a cartridge at an unnatural angle, but you shouldn't be surprised that continued tilting eventually starts to cause more permanent damage to the cartridge, and by proxy, the contacts on the N64 end of things wear away over time, and before you know it, your N64 doesn't work as normal anymore, and probably can't even read any information on a cartridge. It's by far the most predictable problem on this list, and I think that's why I like it so much. Cartridge tilting is already pretty popular and well known thanks to the couple of decades that people have been doing it for, and it's nice to know that there's a reliable, surprisingly entertaining way for me to wreck my N64. You know, besides taking a hammer to it, but where's the fun in that? The wheel's spinning, but the Pikachu is dead. A console dying from cartridge tilting is so much more comforting to me because not only do you know, roughly, what caused the console to die, but at least it goes out doing what it loved. It's like the best last meal it could ever ask for. This has been Rabbit Luigi, and if you've enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more in the future. And if you want to watch one right now, there's one here about the hardest boss fights around. I just want to thank my top supporters on Patreon, including Sarah Malion, Jerome Sankara, and Scott Riker. Thank you for watching, and no consoles were harmed in the making of this video.